Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Quote Shakespeare Hamlet, Act 3. What I do in this series is I first give you a quick nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dig deeply into each scene and pull out five quotes that I think are really useful to help you understand the plays, characters, and themes. Act 3, Scene 2 is the scene in which Hamlet catches the conscience of the king, but before that the players arrive and Hamlet teaches them how to do their job. He, he behaves very much like a Polonius here. Hamlet then praises Horatio's noble character. Remember, Horatio is the character foil for Hamlet, and we see Hamlet's uh, opinions of his good friend there, his only friend, really. The players then perform the play within the play, The Murder of Gonzago, which reenacts the murder of King Hamlet by Claudius, and Hamlet is given firm evidence that, yes, Claudius is guilty. Claudius is indeed upset by seeing his own murder of his brother reenacted on the stage, and he, he, he leaves in a huff. Hamlet tells Horatio that he is indeed convinced of Claudius's guilt. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, these poor guys, re-enter and they warn Hamlet, Hamlet rrr, of the king's distemper and we as an audience really are confirmed in our dislike of this, these guys. Hamlet accuses Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of toying with him in the famous pipe scene. And now at the end of the scene, Hamlet says he's ready to drink hot blood and we the audience are hoping but not holding our breath. First little bit is interesting because it reveals something of Hamlet's complex character and it reveals something of Shakespeare's notions of how drama should be enacted on the stage. So Hamlet and the three players are, are, are together and they're alone and Hamlet starts to lecture them on how to do it. Now just imagine how annoying it would be if you're a professional actor or lawyer or car, car mechanic or whatever and this punk comes in and starts to tell you how to do your job. Very no annoying indeed long-winded, blow-hard like Polonius, Hamlet reveals himself as, and it's, it's very much true. Hamlet's an, an annoying guy, he really is. So he says, oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who, for the most part, are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. So he's talking about overacting, he's talking about bad acting and catering to the groundlings. The groundlings were the penny entry crew who stood on the ground and watched the, the, the play while the rich people had the seats up in the stands. He, he hates actors who pander to these guys. Kind of snobby, kind of snobby, no patience for them. And there's, 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 there's more quotes down here to, to, to support that. This next little quote I just want to briefly mention because it's the old, it's the famous, you know, the purpose of art is to hold a mirror up to nature. That comes from this particular part. And, uh, and Hamlet's talking about, um, he's counseling the actors not to overstep the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone, overacting, is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as it were, the mirror up to nature. Anything that, is, that, doesn't, that doesn't suit, that doesn't feel right, uh, is 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 unnatural acting and it and it goes against uh, the purpose of art. Cringy stuff. Go watch go watch a really cringy cringy TV show or something. If it doesn't feel like like a person would really behave like that, then that's that's what that's what Shakespeare slash Hamlet is talking about there. It's kind of true. Uh, this is definitely his snobbery. Uh, he, he's talking about, uh, he says, and let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. He doesn't have much patience for the clowns. And remember, the clowns were the Hollywoody kind of simplistic entertainment. It wasn't the high poetry and the high art of the complex stories, character analysis that Shakespeare was building into his plays, but it was the stuff that was just the, the purpose of it was to please the groundlings, to get a good laugh. Now, I don't think Shakespeare is Ham. I don't think Shakespeare agrees with him here. I, I believe Hamlet, I believe Shakespeare liked a good ribald, low, he liked low humor. I don't think, I don't think Shakespeare wrote the low humor into his plays merely to, to, to make money, to get the groundlings to come in. I don't think so. Uh, I, think, I think Shakespeare puts this here to show that Hamlet is indeed a snob. Okay, so then the players exit and Polonius, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern enter and the fun ends. The three of them announce that the king and the queen are ready to hear the play and they all leave and Hamlet and Horatio are left alone to have an intimate bro conversation. Hamlet opens the conversation. He wants to say something nice to his buddy, and he opens the conversation with this. Nay, do not think I flatter. For what advancement may I hope from thee? He's very, very careful to make sure that, that Horatio knows that he's not part of this whole corrupt wasteland that they find themselves in. He wants to say something nice to his buddy, but he's afraid of coming across as one of these fakers like, like Polonius and, uh, and, and Claudius. So 
the quote that I think is useful down here is this one. It, it's actually quite lovely. It, it's kind of it's, it's one of these wise moments that something like almost like Polonius would say, right? He says, "Give me that man that is not passion's slave, and I will wear him in my heart's core, I in my heart of heart, as I do thee." Very very nice words. And then he gets a little bit awkward. He says, "Well, it's a little bit. I'm going a little bit too far." But anyway, so they shake it off, and then Hamlet reveals some of the plot about. He's tell, he tells Horatio to, to watch Claudius carefully as the play unfolds. Um, so this, this, is, this, is, this is interesting because uh, it, it shows Horatio as the character foil, the calm, ideal man. Okay? Now, again, it also reveals some of Hamlet's projection because nobody is as perfect as this in the same way that Benvolio is not a perfect guy. He's got his own problems, but, her, but Romeo doesn't see it. Hamlet doesn't see Horatio's faults, maybe because he's not looking very carefully because Hamlet's so wrapped up in his own faults. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so then the then the whole retinue, the king and the queen and the players, they're all setting up and now we're in a, in a very formal environment and Hamlet starts to go off the rails, as you'll see. One has gathered and there's a little bit of small talk and Claudius asks Hamlet, how fares our cousin Hamlet? And Hamlet responds, excellent in faith of the chameleon lizard's dish. I eat the air, promise crammed. Now remember, all throughout this scene, Hamlet is still pretending to be insane in front of everybody. Now he was very different when he was talking to Hamlet, so or sorry, talking to Horatio. So I don't think he's really insane. If that's if, that, if that's part of the question, he's pretending. This is his antic disposition continues throughout this scene. But the things that he reveals are quite telling, and there's a few things that I want to point out here. One is this one, and it's really really important. He says, "I eat." of the chameleon's dish. And back in the Elizabethan times, they, when, when a lizard eats a fly, you can't see the tongue, and so uh, you can't see the fly. And so they used to believe that the, the lizard eats air. And so he says, I, like the lizard, am eating air. I'm, I'm, I have a promise, and I, that promise is, is, is resulting in nothing but air. The promise is, of course, his kingship. He's supposed to be the king. His father died, he is the prince, and he should be king. Look what he's doing here. It reveals that he is, in fact, ambitious. And part of, his fr part of his frustration, part of this, the mental illness that he has, the depression and all that stuff, comes from the fact that he can't voice, he can't stand up for himself. He can't say, look, I'm supposed to be the king now. My, my, my father died and I'm supposed to be the king. How did you get in that place? There's a bit of Oedipal stuff going on here too because uh, the, 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 the great Oedipal complex, of course, is the, the, the son wanting to kill the father and replace the father in bed with his own mother. Now that's really, really complex. Um, you, you can just Wikipedia that and, and you'll, see, you'll see how crazy it is, but that's what's happening uh, in, in, in Hamlet here. It reveals that he's passive aggressive. He, he is, look what he's saying. He's saying right here, he's actually saying, look, I'm supposed to be, I'm the prince and I'm supposed to be, the promise of the prince is that he's supposed to be the king and you took that. He's basically telling Claudius this, but under the visage, under the mask of being insane and talking nonsense. It's very, very revealing. Um, so all of these, all of this antic disposition has actually um, um, got some method in its madness. Similarly here, he goes over and he, and he, and he wants to sit next to Ophelia and immediately his antic disposition banter turns to sexual matters. Uh, which reveals his own discomfort with his own sexuality. It's like, it's, see, if, if it's constantly on his mind, if it is an issue with him, it's a thing with him, then it constantly comes up. And so he sees Ophelia. Ophelia, as we've mentioned, uh, he projects onto Ophelia all of his disgust uh, of women that comes from his mother. And so, and so that sexuality comes out. He says, shall I sit in your lap? And, and, uh, and she says, no, um, I mean my head upon your lap. And she says, "I, my lord." He says, did, "Did you think? Do you think I meant country matters?" And that's that's a reference to 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 sexual that there's sexual innuendo built into that. So he can't he can't avoid it. It's always there. It's always there. Okay. Um, and then a little bit more banter, and then the dumb show enters. Actors are now ready to perform the play, and the entire play is basically a passive aggressive accusation from Hamlet to. Uh, Claudius and very very much directed towards his mother he shames his mother brutally in this in this in this play as you'll see in this in this performance uh, the dumb show comes on and it's just a couple of you know um, um, actors who very very briefly within a minute or so quickly uh, delineate, delineate the, the the plot events of, of, of the main event and you can you can watch one of the movie versions and it's exactly how King Hamlet described his own mur murder by Claudius. So the accusation is very much there. Okay, um, let me just point out a few very interesting notes. In previous videos, we've talked about how 
Uh, drama for Hamlet and for all of us really is is a form of wish fulfillment. Very often, writers when they write novels, they're 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 fulfilling their own wishes in 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 through through fiction. And this is what Hamlet's doing. Remember, he co-wrote some of this murder of Gonzago. He inserted some of his own lines. I'm not quite sure which ones. I don't think we know which ones he inserted. Um, but it doesn't really matter because because it's all wish fulfillment. The king, the player king, is his own father, King Hamlet, and the player. Queen is Gertrude in their ideal form. These are how Hamlet believes husband and wife should behave, and it breaks his heart to see it done well on the stage and not so well in his mind off stage. So the 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 the, the player King, who represents King Hamlet, is getting old, and he says to his wife, "You know, I'm, eventually I'm going to die, and soon you." He starts to say that. Hope, I hope that you live a life after me with a husband and, and live a decent life. And she says, no, 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 I never will. Now you can see exactly what's happening here. Hamlet is seeing the ideal mother and wife being, being portrayed here. And he's looking sidelong at Gertrude and saying, you're not like her. A second time I kill my husband dead when second husband kisses me in bed. I mean, come on. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what he's saying. Um, the the king then says, so she portrays herself as an ideal. She she's the ideal wife and, and mother. The player king, however, uh, is, is the voice of realism. The real real life comes in, and he says, you know, the, the world the world is always changing, and it's not strange that even our loves should with our fortunes change. Actually, that's true. That's actually that's actually quite true. Life life goes on like that. But the steadfast player queen. Hamlet's ideal mother, the wish fulfillment mother and wife says, no way, both here and hence in heaven, pursue me lasting strife. So punish me forever for eternity if once a widow I ever become a, a wife. So there's, there's Hamlet's ideal um, mother and a pointing a finger directly, not directly, pointing a finger directly, indirectly at Gertrude who's sitting over there watching and her response is actually quite interesting. The lady doth protest too much methinks. Great line that, you might have heard it, it's entered our popular culture. She has just had a mirror held up to her and she's seen a reflection of herself that is not very flattering. She's seen an ideal version of idealized love heavenly love, love that is in that Apollonian realm where the, where the woman behaves nobly in Hamlet's mind. Okay, so she has to respond somehow. She's on the defensive. Now, there's two ways that this could be played, I think. Um, if, if, if Gertrude plays it in a, in a guilty way, she could be kind of reserved and, and shy and, and defensively mumbling, uh, and that could reveal her guilt. On the other hand, she could, she could portray it very straight and say the lady like dryly you can imagine the woman looking directly at Hamlet and dryly saying the lady doth protest too much methinks and th in, in which case that would be the more pragmatic maybe Machiavellian Gertrude we're not quite sure as I mentioned several times Gertrude is a bit of an enigma but it's 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 a brilliant response it's either reflecting a, a, a real reality that Hamlet, the idealist, and the failed teen hero, the failed young man hero, he's failed to, he's failed, remember I mentioned, he, he's failed to adapt to the, to the adult complexities, the real adult complexities of adult life. Uh, so is it, is it that pragmatic call? Is she Machiavellian? Is it more than just pragmatic? Is it is it a Machiavellian statement or is she is she indeed feeling the pressure, feeling that she's looking in the mirror and she doesn't like what she sees? Is that what's going on? Um, beautiful response, wonderful response. Then the play unfolds and when they reach the climax where the the murderer is pouring poison into 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 the king's ear, Hamlet gets all excited and he jumps up and he's and he's ranting. If you've seen one of the movies, you'll see him ranting and he says, "You shall see, you shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife." At this, the king uh, stands up, uh, he and says, "Give me some light away." Now, there's a couple of things that are significant here. Obviously, Claudius has revealed his guilt, and Hamlet is convinced that he is guilty that the that the ghost wasn't lying. However, Hamlet has given himself away too. Hamlet is not quite as smart as he thinks he is. Now, Claudius equally is aware that Hamlet is aware that Claudius is a murderer. And so Claudius now, being the man of action, will take action. So Hamlet, I don't know, smart, not so smart. He's, yeah, in, in his, in his un-Horatio-like manic state, he's not calm. He can't do this calmly. 
Horatio would have done it more calmly. He would have just sat back and watched calmly the king's reaction. But no, Hamlet goes, he's, he's the narcissist and he's, he's, he's bouncing all over the place and, and, he, and he makes a, a, maybe a fatal error. Um, okay, so everybody leaves and Hamlet is left alone with Horatio. And I just want to point out this, this important quote. I'll take the ghost's word for a thousand pound. Okay, did, didn't you see, did you, did you see Claudius's reaction? So confirmed, smart. Hamlet is smart to have waited and get confirmation somehow. However, he missed a great opportunity, several great opportunities to do the job. Is he a coward? Is he smart? Is he both? Usually both. Well, Guildenstern and Rosencrantz enter and they still think they're doing something useful for the king. Well, we know that the king doesn't need these buffoons at all. The king knows exactly what's wrong with Hamlet, so there's no need for these guys to spy. But they're still doing their, their kingly duty, their duty to the king. Poor guys, they, they're, they're, they're manipulative. We've seen that throughout the whole play and Hamlet resents that very, very much. And now that Hamlet has, now, now that Hamlet's filled with, with, uh, with, with he, he's excited that he knows that the ghost of King Hamlet was being truthful. He, he, his, his adrenaline is up and he's ready to drink hot blood as we'll see. And so he, he really lashes out at Guildenstern and Rosencrantz in the, at the end of the scene as we'll see. Before we get there, though, I just want to repeat, um, we've seen Hamlet express his am frustrated ambitions to be king earlier when he said that I'm, I'm promise crammed and I'm feeding on air like, like, a, like a chameleon. He does the same thing here. He says, that Rosencrantz says, you know, dude, you know, really, what, what's bothering you? And he says, well, what's bothering me is that I lack advancement. Well, there it is. I'm not in the position that I should be, and I'm still a prince. I'm not the king. I should be king. And he, and he backs that up again with, uh, while the, with, with a proverb, the proverb... Uh, is that while the grass grows, the horse starves. So he's waiting, 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 waiting for the kingship, and he's meanwhile he's starving like that chameleon feeding on air. So double proof that Hamlet, part of Hamlet's frustration is that he wants to be king, but he 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 can't express it, and so it's all bottled up, and he has to release. Uh, he has to he has to say things passive aggressively instead of directly, which is is just eating him alive. Much else that's terribly important in the rest of this scene. Hamlet grabs the pipe, a little uh, like recorder pipe from one of the players, and he accuses Guildenstern and Rosencrantz of trying to play him like a pipe. And it's 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 a brutal scene in terms of you know uh, how tragically the friendship ended. Um, so he says, you know, God's blood, do you think I'm easier to be played on than a pipe? So his his resentment of being manipulated uh, it manifests itself here. Um, a bit sad. Polonius enters and, enters and says, you know, the, the queen is waiting for you. And Hamlet has a little bit more fun with Polonius, this bitter, nasty fun with Polonius. And then Polonius leaves and Hamlet's all alone. And this final, this is a little mini soliloquy, but it's not terribly important. He says, now could I drink hot blood? Words, more words. We've heard those words a lot. Uh, he, he does have confirmation that the king uh, is the murderer and he's ready to do it. But we'll see. He's sidetracked again with the conversation with his mother. Why doesn't he just, if he's ready to drink hot blood, why does he go talk to his mother and promise not to be physically brutal? I will speak daggers to her, but use none. Why doesn't he go directly? He says, okay, I'll go see mom in just a minute. I got some business to do first. He doesn't do that. He goes and he, and he, see, and he sees his mother. And uh, that's quite the scene coming up next. The end of Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 2. Come back for my next video, Act 3, Scene 3. Thanks for watching.